Morning. Morning. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Word of God, word of life. The Gospel reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven came, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angel waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Word of God, word of life. So I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we've been in the book of Mark for a couple of months now. And if you notice something about Mark is things move very quickly. There's not a lot of of time to dig in and get all the details. It's more of just, here's what happened, boom. And in some ways, I really like that because it makes for a very easy reading of, of an entire book in a relatively short amount of time. By the way, Do you remember Pastor Paul challenged us to read the book of Mark back around New Year's? Remember? How are you all doing with that? (laughs) Just just remember that. But, um, But one of the things that I struggle with the book of Mark a little bit is that it doesn't give a lot of details that sometimes are really pertinent to the depths of the story. For to, if you look at today's stories, for example, there are three that are kind of back-to-back little pieces of stuff. The first one is Jesus is baptized, and then the Spirit leads him into the wilderness where he's tempted by Satan, and he hangs out with wild beasts, and angels attend to him, and that's it. And then he goes off to Galilee, and he proclaims the good news and invites everyone to repent. Okay. But there's a lot more that happened in the story with the wilderness and Satan that's in Matthew and Luke. And so I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about some of, the, some of the differences in those stories. For example, um, the first thing, when Jesus is out in the wilderness, it says in Matthew and Luke's gospel that he's tempted by Satan three separate times. The first time, he's tempted to... Um, Satan dares him, I guess, if you will, to turn the stones into bread. He's hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's really hungry, and so this would be a big temptation. But Jesus says, no. And then later on, Satan takes him to the very top part of the temple, which is very, very high up. And he said, you know, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down and let the angels come and catch you and save you. And Jesus says, no. Good job. And the third time, 
Satan takes Jesus up to a very, very high mountain. And, uh, and he says, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you everything that you can possibly see and even beyond it. And Jesus says, no, good job. That's right, because Satan knows that if he can get Jesus to agree to any of these things, then Jesus instantly fails his mission here on earth. He gives in to temptation, and he instantly is not the one who can save the world from the problem of sin. So Satan has a lot at stake, because if Jesus can, can fulfill that destiny, then Satan, his life is over as he knows it. He loses everything he thinks that he has. So Jesus does not resist temptation. And what's kind of interesting is that when he resists the temptation, what he does is he ends up quoting back scripture at the devil. So when he fights against it, he uses the strength of the word of God. Now, how many of you remember those cartoon, like the Bugs Bunny cartoons, where they had the little angel on one shoulder and the little devil on the other shoulder. And it was trying to convince the cartoon characters to, to do one thing or the other. Do you all remember that? Okay, those of you that are younger, I'm sorry, Bugs Bunny is not around anymore. It is, it is a terrible loss for the youth of this nation. <laughs> John's laughing really hard there, but it's true. So anyway, they have these little, the little angel and the little devil on the shoulders, and they were trying to convince the character to do either what was bad or what was good, to give in to temptation or to fight against it. And sometimes I think that the devil still wants to undermine the work that we are doing in the kingdom of God by whispering stuff in our ear that is probably not very true. And so we need the counterpoint. We need the word of God to speak to us and help us to remember that whatever the devil is whispering over here is just not true. So in our sermon series during Lent, we're going to be talking about building blocks of faith that are going to help us fight against those little words that the devil is trying to whisper in our ear. On, on uh, Wednesday, during Ash Wednesday service, we talked about the gift of prayer. Today we're talking about the gift that Scripture is. Because if Jesus can use scripture to fight against the temptations that the devil is putting in front of him, then certainly we can too. But I know when I say that, it's a little bit daunting because sometimes scripture is hard to understand. Did you know that? My, my mom, uh, my, my brother is a Baptist pastor and I am a Lutheran pastor and my mom is like, she opens up the Bible and she's like, I have no idea what this says. So my brother tells her his view, and I tell her my view, and it's really quite interesting. But seriously, there is a lot of great truths about God and about our relationship with God that are in Scripture. There's Old Testament stuff, which I know sometimes because, like, the eyes glaze, and you're like, what is going on here? There's a lot of great stories of the Old Testament of people who had a relationship with God who walked in the ways of God, who tried to follow and do the things that God set forth. There's Abraham, there's Noah, there's Moses. There's the stories of the kings, which some of them did okay and some of them really did not. There's the stories of the prophets who are constantly calling back the people to be in relationship with God. And then you get to the New Testament and you have the wonderful stories of how Jesus rescued us all from the problem of sin. And then you have the stories of how the early church started and the Holy Spirit led people and, and the church grew and, and new understandings about what it means to be a Christian. It's really quite great. But in the middle of all of those fantastic stories, there are all these wonderful little nuggets called verses. Now, my brother the Baptist, he likes to, like, memorize verses up this side and down the other. And I tried it for a long time. And I was not very good at it. I don't memorize things very well. Hence, this sermon's the fourth time I've preached it, and it's a different sermon. Right, Pastor Paul? <coughs> so, save the best for last. But anyway, I have a hard time memorizing Scripture, but there are some things that do stick out that I have found 
and I've held on to for dear life because there are some situations that we are in where it is so easy to give in to the little voice of the devil, the little voice that says, you're not good enough. You know what? You have a lot of baggage from your old self, so, you know, you can never become more than that. Or that little voice of when you're sick, why don't you just give up and just roll over and let sickness happen to you? Or the little voice of you can't do a thing. You're not good enough. You don't know enough. You know those voices, right? You know those little temptations that it's so easy to, to give into, and we have got to fight against them. When I was in high school, my, um, my parents were divorced, and I was on the way to go visit my dad in Colorado. He, they'd been divorced for quite some time, and, and I was a high school girl and had questions and thoughts and sharing and all that stuff that girls like to do, right? Dads are not as good at it. At least my dad was not as good at that. So I was going to visit him, and I had stuff I wanted to talk about. And I was very nervous and scared and, and fearful, and, and I'd share that with my best friend. And she wrote me a letter, and she said, don't open the letter till you're on the plane. So I opened up the letter, and she had written a wonderful note of encouragement, and you can do it, and, you know, just, you know, just say what you need to say, and just whatever. It was just, it was a wonderful note. And then after her name, she had written this little thing called, a little, little verse called Joshua 1, 9. And I went and I looked it up because I was the geeky girl as a teenager who actually would have a Bible in her carry-on. And this is what it said when I looked it up. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And for me, that gave me courage. It gave me strength. It reminded me that I was not going to go to the wilds of Colorado all by myself, that God was going to go with me. And I have to tell you, I have hung on to that verse for dear life more times than I can count in the last 30 or so years. There's other verses, too, that speak to us. I remember when my grandfather was ill with cancer, someone gave him a plaque, and it was Psalm 121, and it said, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And for my grandfather, a man of faith who was dying of cancer, he found his help and his strength in the Lord. I know there's other times, too, when there are people who, who hear those words, of those, those whispers of, of Satan, that try to convince us that we're not good enough, that we, we can't leave the old self behind, we can't move forward. And to them I say, you know what? We are a new creation in Christ. We are a gift to the world. God has called you and claimed you in these waters of baptism, and you have a mission and a purpose for God. Those are the promises of God that we need to cling to. There are so many more that I could, I could stand here and rattle off verses all day, probably misquoting them. But the truth is, is that the promise of God that's found in Scripture tells us that nothing separates us from the love of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. And so if we think that we're falling away or we're having doubts or we're stuck in grief or we're scared of illness or we're dealing with huge challenges that flood our world and our lives, nothing separates us from God's love. Nothing. Even if we make a mistake, we are promised forgiveness and grace and mercy. You know, our world keeps being hit with terrible, dark tragedies. Six months ago, I was here talking about October 1st. I guess it's not six months, five months. We were talking about October 1st and the darkness that came. And now here again, we hear about the tragedy of the school shooting in South Florida. It makes us afraid, doesn't it? It makes us nervous. It makes me a little nervous to think of sending my child to school. To school. But yet we are reminded again that the light of Christ shines in the darkness 
and the darkness does not overcome it. Because the world that Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to claim has already been claimed by God for us. And when we resist the temptation to give in to the, the whisperings of somebody who, who's trying to trick us, and when we fight back with the word of God, we are strengthened, and we are able to be lights for the world. Amen.